All right. Hello. Welcome back. We are now studying Mary Sidney Herbert to the thrice sacred Queen Elizabeth. All right. So we just talked about Elizabeth in a previous video, right? Elizabeth the first, who was Queen of England, um, the second Queen of England. Um, and she was a very sturdy and accomplished and powerful queen, you know, probably the most powerful and accomplished monarch of all of England's history there. Um, anyway, Mary Sidney Herbert wrote a, the poem that we're, we're reading um, about Queen Elizabeth. So, kind of neat. We got a little connection here. So, Mary Sidney, she lived from 1561 to 1621 to the age of 60. Um, and I do have some couple hyperlinks in the, in the lecture if you'd like to take a look at them. Um, more information on the life and writings of Mary Sidney. Um, anyway, she was the sister of Sir Philip Sidney, and he himself was a famous poet, and he wrote Arcadia. That may be the very, the most famous work that uh, Philip Sidney wrote, uh, and Mary Sidney, his sister. She was um, the sister of Robert Sidney also, and aunt to Mary Roth. Now, those were also other famous poets from the time, and Mary Roth actually is another female author that we are reading, all right? Uh, during this Renaissance time period. So that that was her niece, Mary Roth, all right? So Mary Sidney also lived squarely in the Renaissance. Um, so we're talking about the time of Shakespeare here, all right? In fact, some people, you know, Shakespeare's identity, I mean, he's William Shakespeare, right? He wrote his plays, William Shakespeare. But some people speculate, oh, maybe William Shakespeare was just like his pen name. And he was really some other famous person, right, who's writing all this. Okay, why anybody would do that? I don't know. But like they, that that's like some speculation. And there's this whole society called the Mary Sidney Society contending that Mary Sidney was the actual author of Shakespeare's plays. I... I've actually been to one of their lectures, and I, I can't remember all the reasons that they think that, but they think, well, they think that, you know, William Shakespeare did not have um, the family wealth to be as educated as he was. So, you know, when you read his plays, he's got so many references to so many different, like, pieces of knowledge so that you would have to be extremely well read and well educated to be able to write this place and so people some people hypothesize well he didn't know enough to write those you know he just came from like a, a kind of middle um class type background so anyway mary sydney is one of the people that people posit as you know oh maybe maybe she did because she came from a very wealthy aristocratic family and so i had access to the kind this kind of education um so but I don't think most people accept that. I think that's kind of a far out there theory. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up. It shows, it testifies to the kind of, you know, wealth, aristocracy, and education that Mary Sidney um, grew up in. So her father was godson to Henry VIII. So when I talk about aristocratic, I'm meaning aristocratic nobility. The god, Her father is the godson to Henry VIII. And of course, Henry VIII is the king of England, who was the father of Elizabeth I, to whom Mary Sidney is, or, or about whom Mary Sidney is writing this poem. Um, her mother was lady in waiting to Queen Elizabeth I. So a lady in waiting means like one of the queen's group of friends who was always around her in the castle or the palace or wherever she lived. You know, they accompanied her everywhere and kind of, you know, were her people that she talked to and hung out with and played games with and, you know, did everything with. One of the one of those those very close intimate women. Of course, Henry the Eighth, you know, he ended up taking many of his mistresses from those ladies in waiting, and they ended up becoming, you know, his wife. But this was Elizabeth the First's lady in waiting was 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 Mary Sidney's mother. So, no risk of Henry the Eighth there um, actually marrying her because he was dead at that point, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then Mary Sidney herself became a lady-in-waiting to Queen Elizabeth I. She was the queen, queen's lady-in-waiting from 1575 to 1577. So Mary, therefore, had extraordinary educational advantages, um, both wealth and connection, right? Uh, she herself married Henry Herbert, so that's why she's called Mary Sidney Herbert, um, and he was the Earl of Pembroke. So 
you know, again, nobility upon nobility upon nobility. And it's, you know, England's different from, from America or the United States. I mean, when we see nobility, we don't quite know what that means because our country was founded on the principles of not having a, a noble landed class, you know, set apart from other people. Um, and, but this was because England, you know, is a really old country. So it, did, it, um, descended from feudalism this idea of nobility feudalism is just like you have a feudal lord a, a a man who has an army and he's really strong and he's like guess what i have my men they're really strong they're really good at fighting they will protect you if and you can come land on my, live on my land and i will protect you with my you know my strength my weapons and and the men who are part of my of my little brigade here um in exchange for your farming this land and then you know providing proceeds to me. I will protect you. You give me goods in exchange and I will protect you. And I will rule over you. And I will make decisions based, you know, that decide things for this property that you live on. So, uh, and usually those people never owned that property. It was, it was the feudal lord who owned it and they were just kind of considered tenants. All right, and so that's kind of how this nobility concept arose. Um, and then the king kind of, as as they got bigger and bigger territories of land, then the feudal lords expanded and became higher and higher in title until finally they had a king over over it all. All right. And um so that's where you get like the king and then he's got dukes and earls and lords and you know, viscounts and counts and who knows what. All right. Um some of those might be France. I don't know. But anyway, I don't I do know they have dukes, earls, and lords in England for sure. Or they have viscounts. I don't remember. But anyway, um, she was part of this aristocracy, okay? And and once you're part of this aristocracy, you are always noble. You can't leave being noble. noble. Your family is always, you know, descended and um, has this title, you know, that's carried on from generation to generation to generation. Although not every child of the family may inherit that particular title, but um, the title can be passed down from generation to generation, as can the land, right? So, um, so that's why America, one of the reasons when the, when the, um, pilgrims came here and other people, they said, you know, and eventually, you know, we, after the pilgrims are like, you know, a hundred years later or so that we revolted here in the, in the colonies, because we said, you know, we don't, we don't believe in that anymore. We don't believe that certain people just because of their bloodline should always inherit the stuff and should always be elevated higher than other people. You know, for example, England had has parliament and in parliament, it's a bicameral legislature, just like what we have. We have a bicameral legislature. In other words, there are two houses. We have the Senate and we have the House of Representatives. Well, in parliament, they have the House of Lords and House of Commons, but only noble, noble people can be members of the House of Lords and only common people could be members of the House of Commons. So that's why it's called common, commoner versus the lords the the nobility the aristocracy so you know even in government they you know continued this tradition um so yeah that's why you know when we started our own country he said you know we're not having any monarchs there's none of this you know some people are more important or better than other people you know that's why we had that declaration of independence all men are created equal is what it says you know and we learn from from myth right by uh by Muriel Rukeyser in uh, our first week that uh, when you say men, you don't always include women, do you? So even though Declaration of Independence stated all men are created equal and it started off with that premise, you know, in other words, we're not going to have noble people. That's really what it was getting at. We're not going to have a class of people that are elevated over others and get certain property rights that other people don't get and certain governmental rights that other people don't get um, and certain levels of respect and, and privilege in society just because they're descended from a certain family. We're not going to have that anymore. But it did, of course, take generations to have women and many groups of people in society. For example, uh, we have enslaved people. We have um, a, a native um, people in America that were not afforded the same privileges, rights, and um, status in society. So that still took time. But we did begin with that concept that, you know what, we're not having nobility. We're not having aristocracy. We're not having that kind of inherited wealth and power in our country. 
All right. Even though, you know, people could argue, hey, there is inherited wealth if you're the right color or you're the right, um, I don't know, if you're the right gender, right, or whatever. Uh, so it took time to work through that and, and evolve past those ideas. Um, so there might have been like this kind of uh, de facto type privilege in America, even though it's not, you know, codified in maybe nobility or aristocracy. It, it happens through other means. All right, so let's get back to the subject here. So she was well connected. She married Henry Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, moved into the Wilton House, which is one of the most impressive estates, you know, inherited estates in all England. Um, of Wilton House itself, people raved that being there was like attending college itself because of all the notables in residence. Poet Samuel Daniel was tutor to Mary's sons. So he's a famous poet, and he was the tutor to Mary's sons. Adrian Gilbert was the half-brother to Sir Walter Raleigh, who was, uh, you know, um, an explorer himself and beloved of Elizabeth I. So that person also lived there, um, and he had a laboratory there. And Sir Philip Sidney, of course, Mary Sidney's brother, composed there too. While Mary wrote skilled poems herself, she also translated works and co-wrote pieces with her brother Philip before and after his death, she continued writing and translating. Um, after his untimely death at war in the Netherlands, Mary continued Philip's translation of the Psalms. And the piece that re we read for class by Mary Sidney is called To the Thrice Sacred Queen Elizabeth. And it was a dedication to her friend, Queen Elizabeth I. Remember, she was her lady in waiting. Um, with which Mary prefaced her Psalms. So she wrote this and she included this in the Psalms translation that she did with, that she did herself and with her brother. And in it, Mary compares Elizabeth to both God and David of the Bible. So another interesting comparison. She's comparing herself, she's comparing, I'm sorry, Queen Elizabeth to God and to David, two male figures from the Bible. So that's an interesting comparison to make, right? And, uh, this poem, you know, of course, she dedicate, she writes it in honor of Elizabeth I, maybe perhaps wanting to have some ingratiation with, with Queen Elizabeth herself, um, and also maybe wanting to add some ethos to the work. Um, you know, maybe people will take it more seriously. It's translated by both a brother and a sister. And of course, there's that female element. So let's maybe appeal to another very famous female in the land, Elizabeth I. And that maybe then um, causes people to um view her works with more um more respect and more dignity because hey there's also another female who's writing and doing great things and that's the queen of england elizabeth I. all right thanks enjoy reading all about mary sydney in the anthology and the work of hers we read for class to the thrice sacred queen elizabeth thank you